Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on Maimon's political theology. Uh, before introducing our speaker, I'd like to ask you to switch on the video, but I see that most of you have already done so, which is very nice. And I also wanted to mention that after the formal part of this session, we'll leave open the Zoom meeting uh, for more informal conversations. So if you have time and you have a question you weren't unable to, uh, to ask, um, then you can ask it uh, later on. So let me now introduce today's uh, speakers. I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Jitschak Melamed, who is a professor of philosophy at Johns Hopkins University. His research focuses on the intersection of philosophy, Jewish and religious thought, the history of science and the humanities. Professor Melamed is the author of many articles and book chapters on these topics and also on other topics. And he edited various volumes on Spinoza's philosophy. Yet he's probably best known for his monograph on Spinoza titled Spinoza's Metaphysics, Substance and Thought a book that was published with Oxford University Press in 2013. Professor Melamed is currently preparing two further monographs on Spinoza, one on Spinoza and German idealism, and another one on Spinoza's political and religious thought. And it seems to me that both themes are highly relevant to the recent paper on Maimon he shared with us and that we're going to discuss uh, today. So let me now introduce our respondents. Daniel Elen obtained his PhD in 2020 at the Ruhr Universität Bochum, and he's currently a postdoctoral researcher at the same university, and he's working in particular on the edition of Hegel's lectures. Daniel is the author of a monograph on Maimon titled Die Philosophie Salmon Maimons zwischen Spinoza und Kant, A Cosmismus und Intellektkonzeption. And this work was published in 2021 with Maina. Daniel has also published uh, a number of articles on Maimon and Schopenhauer, and he also co-edited uh, some of Schopenhauer's uh, lectures. Now, the format of today's session is as follows. Professor Melamed will start by offering a short introduction of his paper, which is titled the political theology of Salomon Maimon. And um, for those who didn't have a chance to read it beforehand, uh, the paper will also be uh, shared in the chat. After that introduction, Daniel will present his comments and questions on the paper, followed by a brief response from Professor Melamed. And after that, uh, there will be plenty of time for a general discussion. Professor Melamed, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor De Boer. Uh, thank you so much for this very generous uh, presentation and and also for the invitation. I would also like to thank uh, Louise. I think that my was instrumental here. Um, and I, I assume that you read the paper, so that's so my my I I I, I won't. I was not planning to summarize the paper. Um, well. You know, I'll, I can try. I mean, I'll, I'll I'll take no more than ten minutes. So here's basically the the point. Um, what I've been trying to do in the paper is, on the one hand, to uh, present a new version, if you wish, of political theology. So usually, people who are familiar with the notion of political theology look for the writings of Carl Schmitt or um, Agamben, or if you wish, Ernst Kantorowicz, perhaps. Uh, uh, Leo Strauss. Um, I first of all, I want to say, well, actually, there is another form of, of political theology uh, in the writings of Maimon. Uh, I can show that Maimon is actually using the term, and what's interesting, it is a very different kind of political theology. It is very different from both the the, the uh, Karl Schmidt and Ernst Kantorowicz brand, and also from Strauss. In, in many ways, it's almost opposed to what Strauss is trying to do with um, uh, through these notions. Now, um, what I basically try to do throughout the paper is to trace the way Maimon attempts to 
um, uncover uh, what he takes to be the religious secrets, and specifically of Judaism. Um, and I think that if you look at these texts, especially in, in his uh, Lebensgeschichte, you see that he's all the time, he's, he's saying something, but also concealing something. It's always a kind of dialectic of expression, but also concealment. Every time he allows himself to say a little bit more, as if he's really, uh, I, I think, he's, he's really trying to th to speak about certain philosophical secrets. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the philosophical secret, at, at least the way I read it. I think I didn't dare to say that as openly as, as I would say it right now, but you'll see, it, at least it is alluded uh, quite strongly at the very end of the of the paper. For Maimon, the great secret, the great mysteries of Judaism is nothing but Spinoza. Or more specifically, it's Spinoza Sankusmism. So there are all kinds of other secrets, there are all kinds of other versions of political theology, but they are the minor ones. The great mysteries of religion, the great mysteries of, of what Maimon will call the uh, Jewish religion, is just Spinozism. It's the view of God is the only thing which fully exists, while all other things are merely appearances in some way, dependent on him having only a very limited uh, degree of reality. So uh, we will, I'll, I'll be happy to discuss all these texts. I mean, because as I mentioned to you, I think it's important to look at those texts closely because a lot of times Maimon is saying something and then he, uh, you know, he has this kind of long hyphen at the end of the paragraph, which I don't know whether it's a custom of the 18th century, but at least for Maimon, a lot of times just having this long hyphen means I cannot speak more about that, but the intelligent reader should understand what I um, what I have in mind. I'm, I'm wondering whether you are familiar with other uses of, of uh, I'm not, of, of, of this kind of um, use of, of the long hyphen. Okay, now, um, what kind of political theology Maimon is uh, offering? Well, unlike Strauss, for Strauss at the end of the day, the political theology, at least in his early writings, I mean, there are some claims that in his later writings, Strauss uh, became more nuanced, if you wish. But at least in his early writings, the story is pretty simple. I mean, uh, the philosophical truth is atheism, uh, and rationalism leads directly to atheism. That's precisely the kind of claims that Strauss takes from uh, from um, Jacobi. Uh, he wrote his dissertation on Jacobi, and um, and you have to choose between uh, between Athens and Jerusalem. And so, uh, what you have is that you have a, a lot of philosophers are basically just presenting things. Uh, um, um, as uh, exoterically as if they are uh, religious, while really at the end of the day, their views, they are just hidden atheists of something of that sort. So um, what you'll have in, in my mind is almost the very opposite of the theme. I mean, I think that for, for my mind, you really, there, there is a sense of definite, definite sense of esotericism. You don't, um, reveal the secrets, the more secret and, and, and more intimate truth of religion to everyone. Uh, but the secrets are actually deeply religious. There are, it's a very non-anthropomorphic religion. It's a very different religion from the what the common people will think, but it is still a deeply religious view. And, and that's totally opposite to what you have in, in Strauss. Uh, I think it's also very different from what you were having in in in, um, in Schmidt and, and Kantorovich. I mean, so the the kind of, poli uh, of political theology where um, the where the um, um, the sovereign is inheriting divine features or, um, or or characteristics of divine features, for Maimon would be what he would call. Uh, the small mysteries of religion. So yes, there is some sort of use of so-called religious aura or as if religious powers that are assigned to the sovereign. Um, uh, for Maimon, again, that would be 
the small mysteries. That's not the deep philosophical mysteries. Deep philosophical mysteries are actually, and he'll say that quite openly, are going against that. Are, they are trying to really to address philosophical truth that, Maimon would say, um, cannot be revealed openly to everyone. And, and by cannot, he means really, you know, people who do not understand certain things, it's, it's just pointless to tell them that. I mean, they, they won't be able to understand it. But I think that the truth behind this kind of, of uh, great mysteries is deeply religious. Now, I'll add one more thing just uh, to stress that the view of Maimon is actually pretty much in the view of Maimonides. I think that we, we can talk more about that, but he's, uh, he's uh, uh, pretty much, I, I think, following Maimonides. I would also venture to say that I think Spinoza is close to that. I mean, I take Spinoza as a religious, uh, religious thinker, very non-anthropomorphic, you know, very uh, or highly critical of of any kind of of uh, you know clericalism and 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 uh, religious power and religious organization and stuff of that sort. But I think that there is a very strong and deep commitment to uh, to certain uh, conception of God in Spinoza. Um, I'll just one last point which I'll mention before I I, I conclude. Um, there are two points which, uh, having reread the paper uh, a few days ago, just in preparation for this meeting, there were two things which I was somewhat saying, oh, I, sh I should have stressed that. I mean, so uh, one thing I, 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 I should have stressed, and I, uh, there is something cheap about the way Maimon is saying Judaism is. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it, it's a kind of cheap reductions of uh, a tradition that is extremely complex, varied, and, and and just to present it as it's just this specific point, um, it's not serious. Uh, all this being said, I can always say that's part of the spirit. So, you know, just look at how Schopenhauer speaks about uh, um, uh, speaks about Hinduism. It's also extremely reductive. There is as if one principle, and that's what it is. Not to mention how Schopenhauer will speak about Judaism. There it will also be reductive, but much more negative. So uh so my my only so my my warning is just um in spite of the fact that I think that Maimon is extremely sensitive reader and, and his actually his analysis of Jewish culture or Jewish texts is extremely insightful. There is a problem though with these kind of cheap reductions. So I'll, I'll, I'll just mention that. The other thing is there is a, some sense of, of uh, national pride in Maimon. Uh, I have no sympathy for nationalism. And um, and all I can say as a defense of Maimon, that it's a nationalism of underdogs. And usually and in the 18th century, right? And usually we're, we tend to be more uh, forgiving towards nationalism of underdogs. I can understand that. Again, I, I don't share that. I mean, I think that there is a problem there. Uh, but all this being said, you know, uh, uh, it, it, and, and it is an apologetic text, but, but that's basically it. So small correction notes. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so um, we can now turn to uh, the comments by uh, Daniel. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I just uh, posted the, my um, presentation in the chat. So I will uh, share my screen now. I think you can, you can all uh, see my presentation now, right? Okay, great. Okay, uh, at first I would, I would like to thank uh, Karen for the very kind invitation. It's, it's great to be here today, and of course, um, thanks to Yitzhak for the for the very interesting interesting paper. Um, so uh, Yitzhak's paper uh, sheds light on a very interesting and important, um, yet still mainly overlooked aspect of Maimon's practical philosophy. Um, as we have seen, uh, Maimon discusses uh, theologica politica in his explanation and interpretation of Maimonides Moreh Nevochim, 
which can be found in the Lebensgeschichte. Um, this, I, I think uh, this discussion can be seen as a, at least a remarkable contribution to the philosophy of religion in classical German philosophy. The cornerstones of uh, Yitzhak's argumentation are, as far as I see, the following. First, even though Maimon coins his own concept of a political theology in his engagement with uh, Maimonides, his main influence in this re respect is um, Spinoza's TTP from 1670. Uh, second, and this is also the conclusion of this very convincing paper. According to Maimon, the deepest secret of the Jewish religion is uh, its identity with uh, Spinoza's theory that, uh, quote, only God truly exists, which can be, can be understood as a cosmism, the exact uh, opposite of atheism. The existence of God, um, as the single substance uh, is implied in his essence, whereas modes, both uh, finite and infinite, are, so to say, only limitations of this essence. I find this interpretation of Maimon's view on religion in general and on Judaism in particular very intriguing and large, largely uh, convincing, yet I still have a few reservations about that. I would like to point to those aspects at the end of my response. But first, uh, I would like to sketch a few of Yitzhak's um, main arguments, which seem to be important to me to grasp his main thesis. According to Maimon, religion is perfectly compatible with reason. Thus, um, antagonisms such as uh, faith and reason or uh, belief and knowledge, which are prominent in other discussions in classical German philosophy, don't exactly apply to Maimon's thinking. On, on page uh, six of his paper, Yitzhak explains this in the following way, quote, religion's main motivation is the desire to trace the causes of what is significant to our lives. And as such, it is nothing but an employment of the principle of sufficient reason, the PSR. Now, Employing the PSR in this context of religion can happen in two ways, either by imagination or by ratio. The first way, mainly using analogies, uh, leads to the assumption of a multitude of diverse cause, causes for the multi multitude of diverse phenomena. Thus, for example, to uh, polytheism. The second way in contrast, which is uh, the rational way, leads to true religion, according to Maimon, and thus to the assumption of one ultimate cause of, as the source of all phenomena. At this point, um, we should note that a true religion is rational religion, according to Maimon, and thus equivalent with the assumption of a single cause of everything. Based on this distinction, Maimon develops a three-sided taxonomy of the systems of theology, as Yitzhak calls it. Um, first, atheism, which attributes all particular effects to particular causes. The second, Spinozism, uh, which ascribes all particular effects to the one substance as a primary cause, and thus can be called acosmism, um, as the exact opposite of atheism. Uh, third, Leibnizianism, which stands in between those two. This means a multitude of causes for the multitude of effects, but they all belong together in the single system of monadology. Now, in the next step, a true religion can be considered as positive religion, in contrast to natural religion, and can be divided into positive non-political religion, and positive political, political religion, um, which means that it is, it is either concerned with uh, the commun communication um, of the knowledge of the first cause or with uh, civic happiness um, and the, the well, that means the well being of society. Now, as Maimon states, uh, this distinction is blurred in Judaism since a civic happiness might be identified with the acquisition of knowledge in this case. 
The one big mystery of the Jewish religion, according to Maimon, in this context is, as Yitzhak already mentioned, um, the name, firstly, um, the name, as, as Maimon, as Maimon um, develops uh, this thought, uh, firstly, the name Jehovah, as he states in, states in uh, chapter 20 of part one of the Lebensgeschichte. The name Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, expresses pure being, the essence of God is pure existence, in German, das bloße Dasein, in accordance with the root of the Hebrew word uh, to be, he, waf, he. Um, this can be identified as the doctrine of the unity of God and the dependence of all other beings on God's existence, which can only be completely conceived within a single system, as Maimon explicitly states. Now, according to Yitzhak's excellent reconstruction of Maimon's philosophy of religion, this single system can be understood as the system of Spinoza, revealing Judaism in the deepest sense as identical with Spinozism. Um, however, Maimon doesn't state this explicitly, probably in order to avoid the pretty bad consequences of such a stance on Spinozism and Judaism. Um, despite my sympathy for such a reading of Maimon's philosophy of religion, I would like to ask if this reconstruction might go a step too far, at least rationally understanding God as pure being, and thus as the single cause of all, all other beings, as far as I can see, doesn't necessarily lead to Spinozism. That's my suggestion in, in this case. Spinoza's strict theory of immanence and of the substantial dependence of modes doesn't have to be accepted um, in order to establish a single system of the unity of God. At least finite beings can still be understood as, for example, causally dependent on God, not substantially. This would mean that Maimon's account of Judaism in the deep sense could also be understood as something else than Spinozism, for example, like a more, so to say, a Leibnizian system of God as an intellectually creating supreme monad. Um, in this case, identifying Judaism with acosmism would also be avoided. However, this is just a, um, a suggestion. I, I also don't understand Maimon as a true Leibnizian. Um, but in this context, I would also like to ask how Maimon's own philosophy, um, also his theoretical philosophy um, in the essay on transcendental philosophy and later the uh, Versuch einer neuen Logik, um, so how his own, his own philosophy may relate to his account of Judaism. Um, as you know, as you may know from my book, um, which was uh, mentioned by Karin, um, I have argued that Maimon decisively avoids uh, to establish an acosmist philosophy on his own, and that however um, his understanding of Spinoza's system in turn may be limited, or maybe even defective, but that is another dis discussion. Um, now concerning these aspects uh, with regard to Yitzhak's uh, work, I would like to abstain from an, one, from an own one-sided suggestion due to the complexity of this matter, and I'm very, very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, so now, uh, Professor Melamed has the opportunity to uh, briefly respond to, to some of the issues that have been raised. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, it's hard. I mean, so uh, first of all, I, I, I'm really indebted to Daniel. I mean, we know each other for, for many years and, and he, he gave a wonderful summary and overview of the paper, which I didn't, so that I'm, I'm and I think I all the points that he raises are important. So let me try to uh, address a few of them. Before that, uh, I would like just to mention the fact that uh, much of the discussion in this paper focuses on these uh, ten, first 10 chapters of uh, the second volume of Maimon's Lebens and Geschichte. And these ten, 10 chapters are dedicated to the Guide of the Perplexed. Uh, there is something remarkable about these things uh, for several reasons. First of all, Maimon is writing very easily. I mean, it's a very easy to read text. 
Uh, unlike, you know, I, I don't know I, what is your experience in terms of reading the Philosophical but it's on Sintal philosophy or, or any of the other texts, but it's a difficult text. It's not written in a kind of, a, it's not easy read. You read the, these 10 chapters of, of, uh, of, of Maimon's presentation of the guide, it's, it's extremely clear, very easy. And honestly, I think one of the best presentations of Maimonides' philosophy with somewhat moderate, not moderate, I think it's it's taking a little bit more uh, uh, radical interpretation of, of Maimonides, but I, I think he's right, to be honest, but uh, it's a wonderful presentation. Now, the, the interesting thing is that these 10 chapters um, were abused by almost all translators and editors. So I, I'm, I'm saying that as, as part of, um, sorry, a promotion of um, of my, the edition that I was involved in, but if you look at almost all of the all German editions after the seventy, the original uh, seventeen ninety two ninety three, they took these ten chapters, threw them at the back as an unhung of sorts. Um, a lot of times, they simply did not include them. Uh, there are fascinating chapters. There are some. Uh, there are also philosophically fascinating. And they are giving you Maimon's understanding of religion, of Judaism. I, it's hard for me to understand why why to do that. I mean, and and this kind of lack of appreciation for the integrity of the text. I mean, I really. Um, what is it? Um, I can tell you that the English translation, the available English translation that was uh, done by uh, Murray Clark about a century ago, simply did not include these chapters. Um, they were not important. Again, um, and and I think similar stories can also be shown in almost every uh, modern edition, including the Hebrew translation, which again uh, just took the chapters of 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 uh, on Maimonides' guide and just place them as an appendix at the back of the book. Um, pity because they are some of the most interesting and I think most important chapters. And again, you know, I, I think, um, I'm not sure there are many uh, uh, high quality discussions of, of Maimonides' guy that are, can compete really with, with uh, these 10 chapters. Um, okay, now let me, address the issue of the compatibility of religion with uh, uh, with reason. Um, uh, Daniel is absolutely right. I think that's I, that's a view that I ascribe to, to Maimon. And I think it's also the view which you'll find in Maimonides. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll say something even more radical than that. It's compatibility, not only of religion with reason, but of radical religious view with radical rationalism. So it, it's not a kind of, of a you know, semi, not very strong religion and not very strong rationalism, but, but rather in both cases, I think it's just both rationalism and religion on steroids. Uh, now, we, we can debate that about Maimon, I think it is, but if you want to just to have a sense of what of why I'm saying that, in Maimonides, you have this kind of radical religiosity with radical rationalism. Uh, I invite you to just to have a look at one or two chapters. I mean, read chapter 51 of the third part of the guide, 51 and 52. 52 is just one page. Uh, if you have a chance, it's it's not long, it's five pages. Um, and what you see there is on the one hand, um, a, a strongly and radical religious view that is many ways just it's Jewish Sufism, uh, literally Jewish Sufism. On the other hand, um, it's a view where um, the where the intellect is taken to be the 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 most divine element in man, and actually the only kind of connection that you can have with God, which is only through the intellect. So. Um, so you you see this kind of double, um, and and moreover, I think that for Maimonides, any kind of belief that is not but not based on knowledge, at the end of the day, leads to idolatry. So the only way for you to have divine, uh, sorry, to have any kind of knowledge of God or any kind of of love of God is only if you just study God philosophically. 
without that, you can do all kinds of things. You can engage in a cult of whatever you wish, but it's not a cult of God. It's probably just idolatry. Um, so, so I would argue that both in Maimonides and in Maimon, I mean, you really have this kind of compatibility, not only compatibility of, of radical rationalism with radical religiosity. Uh, as you can see, I mean, it's a nice place also to torture any kind of Straussian because it's basically telling the Straussian, no, I'm sorry, there is no way to, to choose. But it's, it's Athens on steroids together with um, uh, together with Jerusalem on steroids. And, and I think that you have a tradition of thinkers who are not willing to make any kind of choice between the two, just taking both of them absolutely seriously and strongly. Um, now, um, let me respond to uh, uh, Daniel's point about whether God is pure being leads to spinacism. Um, I partly agree, I mean, because uh, the passage which I quote about the interpretation of the tetrat Tetragrammaton um, has, so it's a passage in Maimon's in the Lebensgeschichte, it has two interesting parallels. Uh, one is in the TTP, in the Theological Political Treatise, and the other one is in Maimonides himself. I mean, both of them in different ways, and, and here I'll agree with Daniel in, when I'm saying in different ways, take God to be nothing, to be the essence of God, to be nothing but existence. Now, I, I think that we should really understand what does it mean that God's essence is existence. For Spinoza, I think the meaning is that God is nothing but existence. It's not that God is also um, the most benevolent and the most powerful, etc. No, God is, that's what God is, pure existence. And you can very easily see how such a view of God's essence as pure existence lead to pantheism or spinozism. Now, I think that Daniel is right in saying that um, there could be a different understanding. And I think that yeah, I, I would say in Maimonides, you had this view indeed where he endorses the claim that God's essence is just pure existence. Um, but he's not a pantheist, at least not the way I read it. Now, there are some people who are reading like that. I think that uh, Maimonides thinks that God is not material at all. Um, and and so, so there is a different way in which you can take something like uh, the identification of God's essence or the conception of God's essence as pure existence without endorsing a full-fledged uh, uh, pantheism. Um, is Leibniz in that direction? I'm not sure. I think that Leibniz will not say that God's essence is only existence. I think that the other perfections for God, for Leibniz are going to be relevant there. So that's not... Um, now, um, Acosmism. So yes, I I would um, um, I, I'm I'm open to the reservations that Daniel is making. I mean, I I, I think that uh, one of the reasons why I'm stressing acosmism is because I'm for we're you know we, we are a little bit just like reading Maimon in it, it's uh, I'm I'm sure you know the story about the about the physiologists, blind zoologists that are looking at the same elephant and each of them thinks that it's a different animal. And my sense is that I'm looking at Maimon in a, one group of texts and, my, and I suspect that Daniel is looking at a slightly different group of texts. I think that if you look at Maimon's Hebrew writings, you see that in his early on, he endorses the view that God's essence, that, that God is, that the only true thing that exists is only God. I, I've documented that. I can show you this in this in his manuscripts. We've complete. Uh, I'm recently, I, uh, I, I, in a work that I've done together with a colleague of mine, we've completed transcribing Maimon's early manuscripts, and it's a very common view there. I think this is also the view that you find in the Lebensgeschichte. My suspicion is that in some of the later writings, it's going to be different. I, I think that there is a sense in which Maimon is uh, becoming more of a skeptic, and I suspect less of a spinatist in his later writing. But again, I know them much less than uh, much less well. So I'll, I'll stop here. Okay. Hey, uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe you can uh, thank um, both our speakers, so both Professor Melamed and um, and the respondent Daniel, for their contributions so far. 
so now the floor is uh, completely open for further uh, questions. Uh, Brian Lam, please go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you, Professor Karin Dibor. And thanks to Professor uh, Melamed for the paper. Um, so um, the title of the paper is um, The Political Theology of Solomon Maimon. So first of all, I wonder if um, Maimon has got a definition of politics as well. So what is politics according to Maimon? Is it just about um, civic happiness? Um, yeah, so this is my first question. And the second question is, according to Maimon, do we need politics in order to know God? Or do we need God in order to have good politics in our society? And finally, um, what makes um, the political theology of Maimon political as, as his name is? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, um, let, let me begin with the third question because it's, it's, I think it's easier for me to answer that. Um, it, what makes it political because uh, there is a, re a regime of knowledge. I mean, there is knowledge that is uh, going to be shared with some people and not shared with other people. Um, and um, and the idea is that um, um, you th this kind of, of limitation of knowledge is, is justified. Um, now, it's also possible, I think, that Maimon will allow for the, what he could call the small mysteries, meaning you know some sort of manipulation by religious authority in order to move people to behave properly or something like that. Uh, but again, uh, I I I I think that this kind of manipulation by people, the the kind of what thing that you, perhaps you find in El Farabi and others, um, Maimon will say that's that's a small mysteries. I mean, so yes, I mean. And, and also Spinoza will have this view uh, that um, religion can be useful in motivating people to behave properly so that they will not kill each other, will, will love each other, etc. Um, but this being said, I think that's the lower layer of, of mysteries for mine. Now, um, let me go back to your second question. I, I forgot what, what that was. I mean, um, it is um, according to my mom, do we need God? Uh, sorry, uh, do we need politics in order to know God as the one and divine being? Or do we need God in order to have good politics in the society? I don't know. I mean, I'm not aware of any places where he is uh, um, 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 where the, where the whether he's uh, discussing that specifically, I mean, I perhaps we can infer that from other sources, but I'm 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 not aware of any text that basically gives you a good answer on either one of these questions. Um, and and your first question was, yeah, um, whether Maimon has a definition of what uh, politics is. So is it just about civic happiness or? I, I think it is civic yeah. happiness. That's the aims of politics is civic happiness. Yes. I mean, um, I, but again, you, you know, we would need to, uh, in order to try to answer that, I think what we'll need to do is just to look at, the, he has a philosophical dictionary, which was never completed. So there might be some definitions, the more specific uh, politic would probably be, I, I, uh, I, I don't know whether he wrote the entry on, on politic, but um, um, so perhaps there is something more specific there, but what I've seen, I think, is just what you suspect, meaning civic happiness. Yes, okay, so thank you very much. Oh, sure, Matt. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, just a small remark. I uh, I had the same uh, question. Um, and so maybe I, I can I can ask it again. So why, why would we uh, consider Maimon's um, notes on, on the political usefulness of religion and so on as uh, amounting to a political theology uh, and, and not see it as rather a contribution to philosophy of religion. So I think that this is uh, maybe also the, uh, the thrust of uh, Wylam's questions. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. No, so I, th I think that part of the story here is of course, how you define political theology. So if you 
if your notion of political ethology is, uh, if you identify it basically with, with with the kind of stuff that you have in in Schmidt or in Strauss, then it's different. Right? And I would say no, it's not. Uh, the evidence I have is that Maimon himself using the term in a subtitle of one of his chapters uh, on the guide of the perplexed. Um, and uh, in order to, and the issue, I think he, he will never spell it out. So he will never try to tell you what does he mean by political theology, right? But the major issue there in this chapter, I think will be as far as I can understand, I might be wrong, but uh, my understanding is that it's related to the um, to religious secrets, to the concealment of knowledge from some people and not from other people. And here I think that uh, uh, this is the political dimension of this. So it's the political dimension of, um, of keeping parts of the population more and less informed about true religion and popular religion. Right? So making the so there is definitely this kind of distinction between esoteric um, and 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 uh, exoteric, but it's not all, uh, and, and I think Maimon is all the time is interested in this kind of, of esoteric exoteric uh, tension. But unlike Strauss, it's not at all uh, about just atheism against uh, religion. I mean, the esoteric content in Maimon is deeply religious. Uh, now, so when you ask then what what is it? Uh, so what is so much political about that? I think that is just un being capable to understand that um, some philosophical truths are not fitting for certain groups of people they are not going to motivate them and therefore you need to perhaps have a kind of a version of religion that is going to be your more useful and more um, um, um uh, more effective in moving people in the, in their direction that you wish them to move thank you very much that's, uh, that's very helpful thank you sure uh, okay, we turn to Francois. Okay, um, thank you very much for uh, the paper and the presentation. Um, my question deals with a marginal issue, issue um, with a translation issue. Um, since I'm facing great challenges by trying to translate Maimon's Versuch einer neuen Logik into French, and you mentioned in your paper the, the use of dashes the, in Maimon's uh, autobiography. Um, I was wondering what could be your advice by translating? Um, how are we supposed to, to deal with um, Maimon's highly idiosyncratic style and uh, sometimes syntactic problems? Uh, is that um, are we supposed to to correct this or to to let it be as it as it is in German or um, how do you feel about this um, this problem? I, I'm sorry, it's not about um, theology at all, but maybe it is still. So I, you know, I, I'll I'll tell you. I mean, the only reason I I I, I feel myself. Um, that I, I might have in something reasonable to say here is I, I was involved to some degree in the translation of the Lebensgeschichte in, into English. And at least my the attitude that I supported and, and, and pushed for would be just to uh, try to reflect the text as closely as possible. So so I would say, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't want to embellish his style. If his style is poor, German style that it should be reflected. I mean, I'm. I want to see. I mean, I. You know, yeah, yeah. I. Um, the, I. But it, it, again, it's a matter of taste. I think that I want to 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 uh, try to let the reader of the translation have as similar as experience as you are going to have in the original language. And so, if they're in the original language, you're going to be um, 
faced with dilemmas about how precisely to interpret the text, I, I think it would be best to render this kind of dilemma also in the translation. Maybe I can say something about that too, um, because there are some, at least some sentences in, in Maimon's writings, which sound um, really strange even for a native German speaker. And I can imagine, so I am a native German speaker, and I can, can imagine that it's really hard to, to translate those sentences. So I think in those cases, if you really aren't sure about how to translate certain sentences or certain expressions, it, it may always be helpful to, to ask a native German speaker of how he understands it, because it's, it's so idiosyncratic, you know, in, in some cases. Yeah, that, that's good. I, I, I'll, I'll add one or more two points. I mean, um, his Hebrew is beautiful. I mean, he, when he writes in Hebrew, just perfect Hebrew. It's very, not only perfect, it's really beautiful literary style. So that's, you, you should know that. Um, then there, I remember that there were some suggestions, I don't remember who made it, that that sometimes uh, Maimon thinking perhaps in Yiddish, I, I don't know whether it's true, I don't know whether, it, so maybe some of the constructions, perhaps, I, I don't know whether that's true. Okay, so that's that's interesting, and maybe this is also a good um, question that can be taken up uh, later uh, in the informal part, yes, because maybe um, some others have different views as to um, this uh, huge question in uh, translation theory. Uh, so let's uh, turn to uh, Soyun. Hi, um, I have a more general question. Um, so I was hoping you could say a few words about guidance as a concept in the Judaic tradition. Um, it's not something that I'm familiar with. It's development from Maimonides to perhaps Spinoza to how it gets picked up in my mind. And what would be particular about a guidance to Spinozism? Okay, I'm, I'm not aware of many discussions of guidance in, 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 in Spinoza. I mean, I let me say i do think that uh maimonides had a, a significant influence both on spinoza and on maimon i mean there is a certain um intoxication that you can see there are some lines so for example the view of the imagination is something bad right mm -hmm. uh, is something that you find in both spinoza and in maimon and Ultimately, it is the source is Maimonides, I mean, because the, the view is that the imagination is something which moves you from the uh, from the perception of, that is purely intellectual. This being said, uh, when we ask ourselves about the notion of a guide, um, so um, Maimonides is is um, when he gives this this title to the book. Um, he is writing in his 50s. By that year, by that date, he's already a very famous, very influential figure. Um, and he's, you know, he, he, he's not very modest, I can tell you. And, and so he can write with this kind of, uh, you know, with, with this kind of authority of saying, I'm, I'm going to provide you uh, um, uh, the, the guidance, about for those who are perplexed um, sorry so um so my take would be then out uh, is there more question issues about guidance i mean um within rabbinic tradition well mm -hmm. and you know generally uh but i think rabbinic tradition likes There is something which is all that that always invites questions. So that's basically the it, it is the dialectic that is never ending, and in that sense, um, um, a lot of times, I mean, um, authority is respected but is always challenged mm. because always there is a uh, the, it's perfectly legitimate to come in and, and uh, ask a question. And basically asking a question and asking a good question is taken to be one of the best ways of 
of developing a thought of someone. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to say that it's it's an essential feature, but 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 again, within the world of Talmudism and Rabbinism, um, there the most exciting again it's a, it's a matter of taste but the most exciting figures and the most sophisticated are always those that are all the time just challenging everything it's uh challenging everything because everything is if you can i mean if you're able to post a challenge then by all means go and do that mm -hmm. uh maimonides doesn't like that he 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 thinks that the talmud is too un, too anarchistic and, and and too messy and what he's trying to do is he's trying to take this mess which is called the talmud and the rabbinics and try to put it to some sort of order uh he's much more of a good aristotelian that wants things to be organized very very well and all not in this kind of total mess of, of objections and total all that are all the time undermining themselves so so he's basically trying to create a stable situation, stable organization, etc. Uh, what happened to him? He was swallowed by the Talmudist. I mean, his all his texts, which were supposed to be attempts to organize everything in, into some sort of, of a rabbinic encyclopedia that is well ordered, became itself an object of the same anarchistic tendency of raising objections and counter objections. So he lost, I mean, he lost the game to my mind, but you know, I'm, and I, and as you can see, I, I, I am delighted by the fact that he lost uh, the game, but. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Okay, so we turn to Timothy. Thank you. Uh, right, so um, my question, is just about a single sentence that I was sort of still in a little bit hung up on, and I'm wondering if it's, you know, it's, it's possible to interpret it uh, in different ways or in a different way. Um, this is um, it's from Maimon, uh, in Part One, Chapter Fifteen. It's on page eleven of your of your essay, where he says, "In its purest form, uh, Judaism has no mysteries, you know, in the truest sense of the word, and right? not mysteries that, for particular reasons, one does not want to reveal, uh, but rather that inherently cannot be revealed to all." Um, and, and and it sounds like, um, you know, in, in your talk, you're you're coming down on the interpretation of that that says, "Well, it." it, it can't and it inherently cannot be revealed to all because of essentially subjective factors. Uh, I suppose you know, people don't have time uh, or the understanding. Uh, but when I first read that, I was thinking, well, this, you know, that can't be the right contrast because he's contrasting this. Uh, he's contrasting the contingent factors to something absolute, something intrinsic, inherent. And uh, so I and now I'm thinking I, I'm probably wrong, but uh, I read that as in there is an inherent. Uh, intrinsic mystery, uh, a cosmism or God's essence is pure existence. And I, I just wondered if, you know, this is my one perhaps admitting, oh, this is a, this is a difficult uh, uh, mystery uh, for philosophy as well, perhaps, right? Uh, um, yeah, I'm thinking of Kant, uh, you know, at the end of the critique of pure reason saying this, this idea Transcendental ideal is, is the abyss of human reason, right? Yeah. Um, so, so is it, you know, so I wondered what you, and, and maybe Daniel might, might think of that particular. Sure. Of no, I, 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 I think that the, the alternative reading that you suggest is, is definitely possible. So to say that uh, when you're saying it's, it's not a mystery that one does not want to reveal, but rather that inherently cannot be revealed at all. So if you want to read that as a kind of saying, oh, it's not knowable at all. It's something like, uh, if it were only this text, I think this would be a, a, a definitely a, 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 a major way of reading that. Um, I think that in the other text, he does seem to be saying that, um, that there is something that is um, 
uh, that, he, that he can tell you what is this mystery, right? I think that in, in many of these texts, is coming very close to, to saying that it's it's aquismism. Um And um, now, perhaps you know, did he change his mind? Not likely. I mean, it's all it's it's, it's the same Lebensgeschichte. It's not uh, it's written the same time, so not very likely. So 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 again, while I think that your your suggested reading is definitely based on these texts alone makes makes sense I mean, at least uh, uh, perhaps even better sense than my but the thing that once you look at the at, at his other claims in the levels of Geschichte about uh, what is the great mystery of Judaism um I, I don't see hey, I I don't see him going that much in the direction of negative theology I mean that's uh, I think I mean um, so. Okay, um, is that satisfactory? Or Daniel, would you like to uh, comment on this? Just a, a short comment, comment on that. So uh, the fact that, as uh, Yitzhak just said, that um, this this big mystery, uh, according to Maimon, cannot be known at all. So it's it's not um, not available for for knowledge at all. Um, if we understand Maimon in that way, then maybe we can consider his rationalism as uh, you know as, as not not absolute there is still well, what do you say it's like about that there's still some it's a possibility although keep in mind that um there is an interesting way in which rational mm -hmm. skepticism can go can work together so i think peter silke has a beautiful article on that in the context of maimon where a, a, Again, I, I take Maimon to be one of the more radical rationalists, and I think that in many ways he's rationally motivates his skepticism because the demands in order to have a, a, a genuine understanding, that he, his requirement for genuine knowledge is pretty high. And so if you have this kind of high bar, you are left with skepticism, right? Uh, now, so, but, but, again, but again, I, you know, it, it's it's a perfectly legit, I think, open and legitimate. I think this is a great hint, also concerning this matter, because Peter Felke's uh, conception about I think he calls it uh, epistate rationalism. Yeah. So Maimon, in in some way similar to David Hume, has a very high um, notion of of um, yeah, the the demands of reason, which cannot be met in the end, and Precisely. leads to skepticism. So skepticism and rationalism aren't opposed to each other, but by, by stating those very high rational demands and standards, which cannot be met, you somehow have to, to embrace skepticism in the end. And maybe that may apply to, to this uh, topic as well that you mentioned, Tim. It, it could be, although again, I, I would need to look at that, but I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't recall at least in my in just based on my recollection of, of this passage. I don't remember. Oh, I don't remember uh, that um, the issue of skepticism is 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 lurking there. But uh, it doesn't mean much. I mean, right? I mean, a lot of times you remember one a, a text in one way, and then when you read it for the one hundred time, one hundred and first time. You realize that actually there is something else. So yeah, I think it's a good idea to double check and see if there is any kind of reference to um, uh, to skepticism there. I don't recall that, but again, that doesn't mean anything. Just we need to do our homework and, and go back to the text. Okay, very well, uh, Pavel. Yeah, thanks very much. I actually had the same question and it might have been answered in that last exchange. Um, and I see that Wylam has just posted about this in the chat. So um, I guess it is a, a general question. So, I mean, I want it, the kind of reason, conception of reason that underpins that, that claim about mysteries and unknowability of philosophical truth for the masses seems strange for a rationalist and for a Kantian because you know, there the view is the truths of reason are in principle available to everybody. Um, Descartes has that view, Kant has that view, because we all have the same reason. If we just, you know, make a bit of effort, um, 
we can grasp of the truth. This is especially in the practical realm, uh, political realm probably, but moral realm, you know, where in one of Kant's examples, even a an eight-year-old child knows what is moral, um, uh, the moral thing to do, and in that sense knows the rational um, thing to do. Um, but I guess that was touched on in that in that um, in that uh, ex exchange um, um, in that last exchange. But maybe a secondary question was about what kind of political commitments, what kind of particular specific political commitments, this kind of um, uh, conception of unknowability of um, philosophical truth would lead to. It sounds on the face of it like it's incompatible with any kind of um, commitment to democracy. Um, so what were, uh, yeah, I guess what were Maimon's specific um, political orientations in in his in his time and context? It's a good question. I mean, I, uh, I think Maimon's political philosophy is understudied. There is uh, an important article uh, that uh, on, on natural right that has been translated by Jason Yanover, um, but we don't have much. Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll say that. Um, again, uh, so uh, the only kind of reasonable contribution I can have here is the following. Um, when you look, for example, at um, at a figure like Spinoza, I mean, I'll, Coincidentally, right? I mean, I'm just, you know, they picked Spinoza. Uh, Spinoza has a very bizarre view about availability of knowledge. He thinks that, that some knowledge is available to everyone. He thinks that God's essence is known to all. Uh, by that, he means that, um, uh, again, if, if you buy my argument, I think he thinks that even a fish knows what is God's essence. And so far as the fish knows how to move in extension, the fish has an adequate knowledge of extension, something like that. Then it comes a question whether that means that he is a more that he is a democrat. Not necessarily. Uh, I mean, I think that he, Spinoza has very strong democratic tendencies, but uh, but with regard, for specifically to the issue of uh, whether you should preach irrational religion to the masses. There is a very interesting passage at the very end of chapter seven of the Theological Political Treatise, where Spinoza is criticizing Maimonides for trying to educate the masses by providing a rational interpretation of the Bible. Now, um, and what Maimonides is trying to do is basically to read philosophy into the Bible. And when you look at Spinoza's criticism, in many ways, it's criticism that is coming from the right. Uh, Spinoza will basically tell him, why are you wasting your time on trying to educate the masses? I mean, it won't help you. And um, you are just going to spoil their the kind of religion, the kind of, of, of um, cheap religion that, that can actually bring comfort to them. Why are you doing that? Right? So, so what, so now, and, and that's the very same person that tells you that on the other hand, God's essence, not, not less, God's essence is known to all. So I think that when we come to the questions about publicity of knowledge and accessibility of knowledge, we should, um, um, we should try to look carefully about what kind of knowledge in what context. I mean, here at least in the case of Spinoza, you have on the one hand radical accessibility of knowledge to everything, including uh, including to fish, but still at the political level, I don't know to what extent. I mean, he, perhaps he changed his mind in his later works in the political treaties, where he's becoming more of a democrat. But uh, at least there are, he, he 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 seems to be saying no. I mean, you should you should not try to educate the masses too much in some way. Okay, so I think that uh, some of us, including Bailem, uh, find this quite shocking, uh, but um, I'll give the floor to uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Hey, yeah, 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 thank you. I, I would also, um, yeah, directly follow up to, to this and like as 
actually pointing again at the at the interpretation of the um, of the tetra tetragrammaton and about the knowledge of the of the div divine attributes. And I wanted to ask whether you could you could could elaborate a bit how also the the differences uh, in the interpretation of the divine uh, attributes with the uh, Maimonidian um, interpretation how they also um, uh, figure into the the political um, into the um, uh, yeah your understanding of the political theology because like like in my in my reading of 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 Maimon. Um, yeah, actually, actually, Maimon seems to be, uh, even if he is reading uh, Maimonides and like affirming Maimonides, he does it in a very, uh, yeah, idiosyncratic way and seems to completely, um, uh, yeah, dismiss like the like the negative uh, theology of uh, uh, of um, Maimonides and to uh, affirm rather, yeah, kind of a notion of of uh, of university concerning. Uh, divine attributes and saying that, uh, yeah, for example, this being, this is not just, a, um, uh, this is just not, not just a homonymy, but it's the really being in the, in the, in the truest sense and, and all, all other being is, is derived from this um, yeah. one being. And yeah, if you have this, this, this collapse of uh, also in principle, like, like absolute, uh, knowability of uh, of god uh, through this like very rational uh, uh, rational at attribute then um, yeah it also um, it removes then it also removes some some basis for the for the relationship of, of religion and and philosophy in uh, maimonides where it is uh, at least on the surface level about uh, also about the restriction of uh, um, of knowledge, and then one can discuss whether one want to uh, buy uh, Strauss that there is something, uh, be, uh, some esoteric teaching beyond this or not. But first of all, uh, the religious belief is about stating that there is a restriction to the to the knowledge. Okay, it's uh, th there are many issues there. So let let me see if I, uh, and to what extent I'm able to answer that. Um, so the question of I mean, Maimon knows Maimon this negative theology from early on. There is no question about that. Um, I think that when you look at his early writings, so for example, in a, in a Kabbalistic term text called the uh, Marcel Yvnatas Appeal, which is uh, part of his still unpublished uh, Hebrew manuscripts. Uh, he's trying to reconcile Maimonidian negative theology with Kabbalistic theory, and uh, he's not the first to do that. Uh, and his uh, uh, way to do that is actually also not very original. Uh, he's taking the the most the innermost aspect of God, uh, which is then Sof, and say about that we are super Maimonidians, you cannot say anything, you cannot know anything, whatever. And then you can speak about other aspects of God, the, the lower, less, uh, or about which you can, the, you can you can have a philosophical discourse, religious discourse, and all stuff of that sort. Um, what happens later, I, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure. I tend to share your view that, I, that negative theology is not playing a major role there, you know. Although he, there is no question that he, again, he knows precisely what what, uh, what is my money this view. Um, now, let's go back to my money this and Spinoza, and then I'll, 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 I'll see. So, in my money, there's the discussion of the tetragrammaton appears after negative theology, after he's saying all of these kind of human. Um, um, characteristics are described of God. I mean, they don't apply to God. They, you cannot speak about God as a judge. You cannot speak about God as good. You cannot speak about all kinds of qualities that you cannot speak about God. Um, and then he he's saying, well, um, um, uh, then the tetragrammaton gives you an indication of the true meaning of God, and then in another place you say the tetragrammaton really indicates God's uh, God's existence, pure existence, something like that. 
So when you combine these two sources together, one saying that the tetragrammaton indicates God's essence, and the other one saying that the tetragrammaton indicates existence, then you get the conclusion that God's essence is existence. Now, Spinoza sees that, and he quotes that, and then add to that a small note in brackets, which is eri vera. So just in Latin, and in truth. <laughs> So, and, and he's saying, that's really the view. I mean, he endorses this view. It's a kind of a marginal note, but he simply endorses that, which is quite nice, quite interesting. I mean, that's, he doesn't need it for the rhetorical purposes or the, or, or, or the, or the um, uh, 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 argumentative purposes of, of the quote. Uh, still, it is really something that is important for him. Um, now, what Maimon is doing there is not absolutely clear to me. Um, I, um, I, I think that he now um, th this interpretation of the tetragrammaton is indicating God as a pure existence. God is very common within the rabbinic tradition. It's not the only interpretation. There, are, there, are, there is a whole different branch. But it is, I would say, the major interpretation. You find it, uh, I would say, hundreds of Kabbalistic sources uh, view that God is just pure existence. Partly because, again, I don't think that rabbinic tradition has, is, is really afraid of pantheism. Usually pantheism, panentheism especially, is taken to be pretty, uh, I would say, mainstream, uh, within, uh, definitely within the Kabbalistic tradition. Um, so, so I take it that Maimon is basically, uh, by endorsing this claim, I mean, he is uh, either continuing it and basically saying, well, that's, um, I'm, I'm part of that story, I think. Now, again, is it going to be always the case? I'm not sure. I mean, I think that Maimon is this person who is changing his mind. I mean, Especially after seventy, I mean, at some point we know he's telling us that he becomes more, more human and less of a spinitzis or something like that. Okay, uh, where, where can we learn about his his early kabbalistic um, Maimonidean reconciliation? Um, so. Um, there is the best article is by there is a, a very good article by um, Moshe Dell on on Maimon's Kabbalistic works. I think it's in English. I'm not hundred percent sure, uh, but it's Moshe Dell is the greatest scholar of Kabbalah active today. Could you maybe uh, put this in the chat so that we get the um, the spelling for yeah. those who are not familiar with this uh, with the author? Yeah, uh, Moshe Dale, sure. Um, and and I touched upon that in my in in an article I published called Salman Maimon and the Rise of Spinozism in German Idealism, which appeared in Journal of the History of Philosophy in two thousand four. So um, right now we I I've complete we have completed transcription of this uh, complete of this manuscript, and. Um, uh, we're looking for someone to do the uh, translation into German, but but the edition is is, is basically done. The the edition of the of the manuscript, uh, the of the Hebrew manuscript is done. Is this uh, a job announcement? Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it's uh, I, I think that one of the people who uh, yeah yeah uh, the the um, the master is Katerina. I mean, she she's one of the people leading this effort. So uh, you should ask her. But yeah, we are looking for some people to do this uh, translation of there. From uh, Hebrew into German. So we currently have there is a project of of a critical edition of ten volumes of critical edition of Maimon's works. Uh, Katerina is one of the of the general editors. I'm involved in editing the Hebrew text, but I'm not going to do this translation to German because German is not my mother tongue. So, uh, so I was able to to do my share uh, together with a colleague of mine in terms of preparing the crit the a critical uh, edition of the of the Hebrew text. But we are looking for someone now to to help us with the translation into German. 
that's yeah, very good because the recording of this uh, discussion will be uh, available to everyone worldwide. Excellent. <laughs> okay, uh, so um, we return to um, pure philosophy, hopefully, with a question uh, from Luis. Yes, so uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for the presentation, for the discussion. Um, yes, I, I, have, I have a very general question and, uh, and it is related to, to Maimon's uh, rationalism or to this expression that I really like that you used is uh, Athens in steroids or rationalism in, in, in steroids. I, at, at the end of the paper, you make this contrast between um, Jacobi's and Strauss' position that mm -hmm. uh, rationalism would lead to atheism. Right. And one could also read Kant a little bit in these terms that he's trying to limit reason to make room for faith and so on. And, and at some point uh, in classical German philosophy, there was a, a, a kind of shift that leads in the direction of Hegel, where he recognized different spheres of rationality. You have the rationality of the understanding, rationality of reason, and so on. Sure. And, and, I, and I was wondering if what, what is the position of Maimon in this constellation? Do you think that he plays a role in this shift from uh, a limited reason to a non-limited one that would lead to an exploration of new spheres of rationality and yeah, wh wh where does he fit in this constellation uh, in your view? Oh, I, I think he did. Uh, so um, you, you remember the letter that, uh, um, that Kant sends to Maimon in which he's saying that your view is not, is not, you are not a Leibnizian, you are really a Spinozist because you take the human intellect to be part of God's intellect or a restricted version of, of uh, God's intellect, right? Um, so I, I think that Maimon is one of the, or would have a very important role in basically trying to eliminate the given, right? To given, to eliminate um, the irrational element of intuitions. And and if so, if and if you think that um, radical idealism is basically an attempt to get rid of the given, uh, then Maimon had a, a crucial a crucial move there. Uh, now, his uh, um, his motivation there is based on the principle of sufficient reason. I think that he's one of the more radical adherents to the principle of sufficient reason. Um, but um, where he'll be, I, to my mind, very different from Hegel is the whole issue of dialectics. I mean, so um, I think that he's a, he's a good Aristotelian in terms of his attitude towards the logic, and, and uh, he's not going to celebrate contradictions or or, or this kind of, of uh, dialectic and antinomies and stuff of that sort. Um, but but in terms of of just um, of of um, undermining the gap between the finite and the infinite intellect, I think both Maimon and in the and Spinoza are quite essential there. I mean, right? I mean, it's basically the attempt the attempt to say no. I mean, uh, you can come and say that there is some sort of art deep in the soul of the human beings that explains how intuitions uh, and and and. Uh, and um, and and concepts are agree with each other, but Maimon would say very nice. Uh, but uh, why should I accept that? I mean, I I cannot accept it only because someone with the authority of a wonderful philosopher like Kant is telling me. I want to see some sort of an argument, and um, I don't think he sees an argument, and therefore he's saying, well, I I can provide an alternative interpretation where I can explain the agreement of concepts and intuitions, and the explanation would be built based on the claim that eventually intuitions are just um, uh, unclear concepts, something like Leibniz, not precisely, but something like that. Uh, Louis, concerning this matter, do you know Lydia Gasparoni? Uh, no. She was a, a Maimon researcher from, I, I think, Rome originally. She is now in Berlin. And she wrote a few papers on a possible influence of, of Maimon on Hegel, okay. especially con concerning the antinomy. And of course, 
Maimon is not a dialectical thinker in, in Hegel's understanding, but Lydia Gasparoni um, thinks about possible influences in, 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 in this respect. So maybe uh, you can uh, see her publications con concerning um, this matter. And yeah. uh, regarding Jacobi, I think that's a very, very interesting um, aspect because Jacobi, in, in, in my view, has got a very a completely different account on, on reason or on, on Vernunft, because in, in Jacobi there are different understandings of, of Vernunft. So a ratio and some other kind of, of non-rational Vernunft. Um, so in, in, um, concerning this aspect, I think it would be really interesting and um, yeah, really interesting to, to compare uh, Maimon's and, and Jacobi's accounts, uh, Maimon's and Jacobi's understandings, accounts of, of Vernunft and, and rationality. Um, I think there's not so much uh, research on this topic yet. Sure, yeah. Yeah, thank you. This, this is really helpful, thanks. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, meanwhile, uh, Jonathan put uh, a paper by Lydia uh, in the chat for those who uh, would like to take a look. Yes, thanks. That's yeah. exactly the one I, I had in mind. Thanks yeah. a lot. Oh, great, thanks, yeah. Jonathan. Yeah. Okay, uh, so then we turn to uh, Joseph uh, Frankel. Yes, hi. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, number one, about the ca compatibility between uh, pantheism and rabbinical views. Uh, just a very simple question. How would that be possible? How would God be able to talk to Moses or... A pantheist, a pantheistic God is just the universe itself. It's not something that talks. How would that work with the Torah? Well, um, as, as you know, I mean, uh, rabbinic hermeneutics, a lot of times it is very much non-literary. In fact, literary interpretations of the Bible within the rabbinic context are actually taken to be some sort of elite version. Uh, the standard interpretation, the, 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 um, the, the bread and butter interpretation are a lot of times are allegor allegorical and the, and the Talmudists are doing that all the time. So uh, if there are passages in the Bible which ascribe to God all kinds of uh, things which they think they are not proper, they will just reinterpret them. And they're doing that time and again and again. I mean, they and they would be they, they they would be willing to kill someone because of not uh, keeping the Sabbath for something that was not a literal God talking, like a sentient God talking. When I'm saying talking, I don't mean talk. I mean a pantheistic God doesn't is not sentient. It's not like a sentient being that, from my understanding. A pantheistic God can be do, can can be many things. I think can, it can be it, it can have thought. It can be, you know, in principle, pantheism can be compatible with also perception of God as a person. Uh, it doesn't have to be. I mean, mo many cases of pantheism are such where uh, it is not perceptive. But uh, this being said, um, the view. But but oh, I'll tell you even more than that. The view of God as being any everywhere is also pretty present in the Bible. I mean, Vodom uh, Leolam, meaning his, um, his glory fills the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and when you look at traditional rabbinic commentators, uh, many of them will say that um, uh, there is no place that is free from God. So God is mm -hmm. present everywhere. Let, let, let us add Panimene. Right. Now, uh, next to that, you will have some uh, rabbinic commentators, some of them more, more bold, some of them are less bold. Uh, so you'll have, for example, one of the, we are talking about the end of the 18th century, you have one of the uh, first uh, figures of Hasidism uh, writing that uh, whenever you're speaking about an idol, the problem with idolatry is not that you think that the idol is divine, but the problem is that you think that the air to the left and to the right, to the up and to the down of the idol is not divine. Mm -hmm. It's free from God because it's not. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then you can see how bold 
some, so the figure I, I have in mind is Rabbi Yaakov Yosef Akohen of Polna, really one of, right. yeah, one of the two, three uh, uh, major figures of, of early Hasidism. Uh, he, he'll say that, you know, you need to say it carefully, don't say it to everyone, but he's, he's, he's willing to endorse it, he, willing pretty openly to endorse his view. So um, now, of course, uh, what does it mean that God speaks? You know, uh, I, I think most or many rabbinic tradition, uh, many rabbinic interpreters will say, no, God does not have a mouth. So if God does not have a mouth, then there will be figures that will say that he does. But I think the majority will say, no, he doesn't have a mouth, mm -hmm. right? So there will mm -hmm. be a place for all kinds of non-literal interpretations. So, now, so they, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So now, now the, again, the, because it, at least the way I read rabbinic tradition, I think it had a very poor regime of, of beliefs. I mean... Uh, it was trying to create dogma, it failed. I mean, the, the attempts to create dogma were colossal failures. The greatest example is actually Maimonides with his 13 principles, uh, whatever. So, uh, and because of the, the lack of any kind of agreed dogma, um, you will find within rabbinic literature, you'll find so many diverse opinions about what does it mean that God speaks? Well, some will say, yeah, he has a mouth. Some will say, no, it just... Uh, some sort of 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 intuit, uh, some sort of of um, um, a flow from God's intellect, or something like that. Mm. Uh, I think you had also, also had a Joseph. I think you had a second question as well. Yes, I did. But first, uh, one one small clarification: Was Spinoza's God uh, uh, sentient? What do you mean by sentient? I mean, you know, was it, it a thinking thing? In other words, the way let's say science yes. is now. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, God is a thinking thing, definitely. But God does not have a free will. Now, in a skip, I understand where your question is coming from, but you can also say ask the very same question whether Spinoza's human being is sentient. Well, yes, it is thinking, but it is also an automaton. Mm -hmm. And it has no free will. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Spinoza's God uh, is thinking. It has an infinite intellect. Uh, it has no free will. Mm -hmm. And my second question was, I, I remember from a while back that Maimon at, end, Maimon at the end of his life was asked about belief, and he said, that it's all wishful thinking. My sense then was that he was a complete atheist. Am I mistaken with that? It's hard to say. So you are speaking about the conversation with with the with the um, Father Chegai, I think. If I, I might be misspelling his name, uh, but I think he was speaking with the uh, um, uh, with a pastor. Or a I think it's a pastor. Yeah, but but it's correct, Chegai. Yeah. Chegai. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and um, so it's it's a good question. What is what precisely is happening there? So he is not looking for someone to provide him with some sort of uh, uh, comfort about the afterlife. On the other hand, in the it's it's a very short conversation. It's two three pages. On the other hand, you see him at the very same place saying, "I I wish it was all different." Now, what does that mean? I don't know. I mean, just uh, I think that his what are precisely his views there on his deathbed, as reported by Chegai, is a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think he believes in afterlife. That's that's true. Now, uh, but you know, the question is whether Maimonides believed in afterlife. That's another question. But <laughs> we'll put that aside. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. My pleasure. Yes, if I can just add one uh, comment uh, to this, I think we also need to take into account, of course, that um, these authors could not just uh, speak their minds. Yes, yeah, so, so that I think makes it very hard to determine uh, what they actually thought about the existence of God and, 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 and more specific uh, religious matters. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what you think about this, uh, Yitzhak. Uh, but but I think it is it is an aspect that hasn't been um, discussed so far in, in in this session. 
Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mentioned the fact that that Maimonides, the, I'm sorry, not Maimonides, that Maimon is, they, is saying very explicitly that uh, is is employing the distinction between uh, exoteric and esoteric teaching, right? Um, and he tends to see so uh, it's uh, one place where it comes very very significantly is in his discussions of Leibniz, because he thinks that Leibnizian conception of God. Uh, as a person with all the traditional religious views is something which is unbefitting a philosopher like Leibniz, meaning Leibniz is too much of a good philosopher to believe in these kind of fairy tales. Uh, I think he's wrong. I think Leibniz believed precisely in, I think Leibniz believed in everything he was saying in the, in the Thodyssey. I mean, I think, but, but you know, but that's, that's Maimon's uh, view. So he, he at least, he thinks that that Leibniz is um, uh, writing in a way that is trying to appease the masses, but uh, uh, but does not believe in in, the, in 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 his religious views. And again, I think it's simply misreading of Leibniz, as far as I can see. I'm I'm not at all a specialist uh, in this regard, but I. Uh... I tend to think that Leibniz would also distinguish between a more exoteric presentation of his views uh, that, that would agree with the, you know, the, the common understanding of God on the one hand and, and more philosophical or more esoteric. Uh, account. Could be, could be. I mean, you know, there the kind of free that Leibniz was a hidden Spinozist that had, had its followers also in the 20th century. Um, 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 Russell occasionally tends to that. I, I think it's sorry more complicated. But and and yes, I think that Leibniz himself is aware of, of the issues of politics with the gap. Yes, absolutely. Okay, maybe there's time for one uh, final question. If there's no pressing question at this point, maybe we can um, uh, conclude the formal part and uh, thank uh, both uh, Professor Melamed and, and Daniel for their excellent uh, contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and then I would also like to mention our uh, next uh, session. Uh, let me uh, let me um, sorry, get my notes. I think it's uh, it's on the twenty sixth. Um, yeah, sorry. So no, October twenty seven. We have the next uh, session. Uh, the speaker is Owen Ware. Uh, the respondent is Paul Geyer. And Owen Ware will talk about uh, Kant and the causality of freedom. And as in this session, it is um, based on um, a pre-circulated uh, paper that will be available in, um, uh, on the program of our websites uh, very soon. So um, it's of course a very different topic, but even so, maybe some of you would like to, uh, uh, to be there as well. So uh, thanks again, everybody for attending. And uh, as said, feel free to, uh, to hang on uh, while we um, stop the recording uh, and, um, and resume in a more informal setting. <laughs>